movement has changed my life. Movement has unlocked a wellspring of confidence. When you develop an appetite for your own power, mediocrity doesn't taste so good anymore. Hey, everybody. Boy, are you guys in for a treat today because Robin Arzone herself, the inspiring and highly energetic, self-proclaimed ambassador of sweat and swagger is back for her fourth appearance, but very first video appearance on the podcast to drop truth bombs and deliver the goods on time. For those newer to the show, Robin is a former lawyer turned global fitness icon. She was named one of the most influential people on Fortune Magazine's 40 Under 40 list in 2020. And she's currently the Vice President of Fitness Programming and Head Instructor at Peloton, everybody's favorite home fitness obsession. In addition, Robin is a two-time New York Times bestseller. Her books include Shut Up and Run, and her latest, which is a children's book, is called Strong Mama. And she recently released a masterclass on mental strength, which you can find at masterclass.com. In addition to catching up on her life since we last sat down six years ago, we discuss the hows and whys of developing mental strength. We talk about the importance of unapologetically owning your story. We discuss pre and postnatal fitness, talk about how to say no and own your yeses. We discuss life pivots, how to begin a fitness journey, and many other topics. I absolutely adore Robin. She never fails to ignite. And I should mention that if this conversation leaves you inspired, as I suspect it will, there's much more where that came from. You should check out RRP 99, RRP 137, and RRP 230, links to which you can find in the show notes on the episode page at ritual.com. So please click that big red subscribe button. Thank you very much. And enjoy the singular force of nature that is Robin Arzone. It has been many years. You've been on the show three times. We were just chatting before the podcast, uh, but all of those episodes were in New York City and generally under super cramped conditions <laughs> from one <laughs> tiny hotel room to your tiny apartment back in the day. Um, so it's good to actually have you here in the studio in Los Angeles. Welcome. I can't wait to catch up with you. It feels good. Congrats on this space. It's stunning. Yeah, thank you. Um, we love it. And uh, it's just allowed us to grow and do all the things that we're going to talk about today. Yeah. I was reflecting back on when we first met. You remember that, right? Yeah, yeah. It was in, in Vegas. In Las Vegas mm -hmm. for that Tony Shea Zappos weekend. I'm yep. not sure exactly what that was, but it was super fun. Amanda Slavin put that whole thing together. I remember. We connected and we each got up and gave little talks and we got to spend a bunch of time touring that area of downtown Las Vegas and kind of what that Zappos community had created. And I just remember we were both very early in our journeys, but I remember like thinking, this girl's a star, like she's gonna be <laughs> huge. And it's been so fun to watch you blossom over the years into what is, what can be characterized as only like legitimate celebrity. Like you're on the Today Show all the time. You're in People <laughs> Magazine, like it's crazy. Things have, <laughs> you know, like, it, like do, you do you have perspective on that? Like it's wild to have watched your arc. I guess I have perspective, but then also not. I'm just in my... Mm -hmm. Doing your thing. In my flow. Like, I'm super in alignment. And that feels... Yeah, we. I, I try to zoom out. Uh, I find that ambitious folks don't... Um, are always on to the next thing without really having that moment of awe, mm -hmm. which I, is is really rewarding. So I try to press the pause button, but I'm not very good at that. Yeah. I'm always on to the next. Yeah. It's important though. Let me reflect it back to you because I do remember <laughs> early on and you had, you had game. It's not like nothing was going on back then, but the difference between then and now is, is pretty significant and you, you deserve it. Like you owned it. And I just remember back then this sense of you standing in your strength and having a certain, um, knowingness about like where you were headed with a vision and you executed on that vision. Thanks, which man. Is cool. It feels yeah. really it does feel it does feel good. And I remember meeting you um 
after your keynote at the Vegas thing um, and being like, I just being in so in awe of like, because I had already read your book and mm-hmm. I already knew about you in the ultra world. So it's fun to see my friends win, mm-hmm. you know, and, and you're definitely, you're, you're slaying yeah. it. Well, you're, you're somebody who's always been really good about cheering for other successes. And, you know, it's, it's easy to, to fall prey to competitiveness or pettiness. Like, why is that person getting that? And why am I not getting this? Uh, but I've just found that when I'm in gratitude and, I'm, and, I, and I am cheering for my friends to win, like the pie just expands. Definitely. Like it's, it's like getting over that idea of a zero sum game, I think is really important in terms of just not only feeling good about yourself, but being in that, in that expansive growth mindset. Definitely. And it allows us, um, I mean, for sure. Yeah, I, I subscribe to a growth mindset, but I also just want to feel feelings that are good for my immune system. And when I'm in that like place, if I if I'm in an envious place, I either use the envy as a clue, or I keep it moving. Mm-hmm. Like if it's not helping me and it's not strengthening my spirit, I I just I, I can't. Well, one of the things you have said, which is interesting, is you have this sort of countertake on jealousy, right? Mm-hmm. Like how to use, like if you're feeling jealous, that's an indication of what you want. Like mm-hmm. pay attention to that. Like mm-hmm. perhaps don't descend into envy, but figure out what it is about that other person that's making you jealous and fix that within yourself. Yeah, I've used that. I mean, that was one of the biggest clues when I was a lawyer. That was one of the biggest clues that I should not be no longer be practicing law because I was looking at my friends who had freer schedules or more creative pursuits or were, you know, athletes. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was so envious of that. And um, that was a huge clue. Well, maybe let's back it up a little bit. You've been on the show three times. So longtime listeners know your backstory, but the show's a lot larger now. And I think it would be helpful to just recap some of that backstory to contextualize what we're going to talk about. Sure. So go for it. (laughs) Wherever you want to start. I don't know. You probably get asked this a lot, but I think it's important. Like you were a corporate lawyer. You had this traumatic event occur and it kind of set in motion you thinking more deeply about who you wanted to be and what you wanted to do with your life. Yeah, that's right. And I used, um, so I was held up at gunpoint in New York City when I was in my early 20s. And I used, having never been an athlete, never run a single mile before this incident. And then during law school, I used movement to heal. And I I really healed myself through the runs. And I did talk therapy and, you know, the stuff that trauma survivors are quote unquote supposed to do, but I found that the runs were the most healing for me. Um, And I started running a ton of marathons, some ultra marathons, um, and then ultimately left law. And I am found my way into wellness. I'm a leader in wellness. I'm vice president of fitness programming at Peloton, head instructor, an author, a mother, a... um, I mean, I'm like a classic multi multi right. hyphen it. So we're we're a bunch of hats, but yeah. um yeah, that's that's kind of my game now. You hitch your horse up to the right or you hitch yourself up to the right horse with Peloton because you were at the very, very beginning of that. And it must be equally gratifying to see how Peloton has exploded and become this thing. Cause I don't know that early on there was indications that it would be as successful as it has become. Yeah, I mean, I I really did see the vision and I continue to see the vision. It's, I mean, the plan is global domination. Uh-huh. And <laughs> that, that, that I think that's Peloton's plan and that's my personal plan. Right. So, so walk me go. through the evolution of Peloton from the beginning of getting involved to, you know, how it's matured into what it is today. Well, initially it was a bike company. You know, it was a, it was a spin studio in Chelsea. And the, you know, there was always a connected hardware and software component to it, but um, I was the second, no, I was the second or third instructor hired and very much in in the nascency of of this company. And it was very interesting. Um, 
pivoting f- during the pandemic because we had already been accustomed to teaching, you know, to a little red dot, you know, mm-hmm. when that camera goes on. So the cameras were part of it from the get-go. From the beginning. Mm-hmm. And people forget that at that time, SoulCycle dominated everything. And there was this notion of like, well, who's Peloton? Like, why would you go there? There's SoulCycle. Yeah, I mean, the industry was really running with uh, as a studio business with a real estate model. Like, if you didn't have... X amount of footprints in however many cities, Mm -hmm. you were irrelevant. And Peloton really, really changed that paradigm. Right. So was there an inflection point where it tipped over where, I don't know, suddenly you get recognized on the street or something like that? Like, how was it, you know, what, what was the evolution of that where you realize like, oh, this is, this is like way bigger than perhaps, you know, I thought it might be when I first got involved. The leaderboard started growing. I remember I had a moment, one of my um, Thanksgiving classes, maybe in 2016 or 2017, had like more members on live than Madison Square Garden. Uh Wow. That felt like, oh, snap. That's kind of wild. Yeah. Um, And it's been growing ever since. (laughs) Right. Now, you know, now we've got like million, and over six million members. accelerated the whole thing, of mm-hmm. course. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so what is it like now? We have a new studio called Peloton Studios New York. So we have Peloton Studios New York, and then we have PSL, which is in London. So two flagships. Mm-hmm. So it's not in Chelsea anymore in that same place that no, I went to? No, we, we have a beautiful new facility oh, in that? Hudson Yards. Oh, wow. And um, yeah, we have... We film yoga out of there. We film strength. We film tread. We film cycling. Um, we ha- even have it like an audio only kind of setup. Um, we're all run on a tread and just record the audio for mm-hmm. our app. So it's a full blown. I mean, we have. I can't even. I don't even know how many hours of live tape we have. I mean, we're we're essentially in right. network. Right. Yeah. There must be thousands and thousands of hours of, thousands. of archived yeah, classes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and so in addition to being, you know, head instructor, what is the role that you play as, as VP within the company? Like, what does that look yeah. like? My, well, my executive function is within the content department. So the chief content officer is my boss. And I am an advocate, I guess, for the talent, te- for the talent and as well as an intermediary, whether it's with marketing, whether it's with our engineering folks, our product team, you know, if an expert, a fitness expertise is required. I'm usually the voice in that meeting, in that mm-hmm. room. And are you helpful with like finding the other experts out there to hire for these, you know, particular specific roles? I don't, as it relates to instructors, yes. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm usually one of the last interviews for <laughs> blessing somebody to come uh, onto the team. Um, what's the yeah. question you ask these people? I'm kind of a hard... <laughs> I, I know, like, yeah. <laughs> I'm a tough if interviewer. If the buck stops with you, if you're the last stop on the train, like, what does that look like? <laughs> this young person comes in, you know, with with uh, ideas of of grandeur, like I'm going to be a Peloton instructor, and then well, you drop the gauntlet on them. It's not so much a gauntlet as it is listening to um, my gut instinct, because there's. There's always a little bit of artifice, right, in an interview because you're putting your best foot forward. But it can't be like I'm auditioning for a role in a movie, right? Mm-hmm. Because after thousands of hours of teaching a class, you're gonna that's gonna erode. Right. And you're gonna see what what's the kernel really there. And there needs to be a point of view. Of course, there's an expertise. I mean, that's like you wouldn't even get in, in, you wouldn't even audition unless you have you know, a pedigree of athleticism and expertise. But you need that authentic charisma. You have to be able to host a television show unscripted while sprinting. Right. (laughs) That's a very specific (laughs) skill set. Yes. When I see you doing your thing, like it does look so natural. It is who you are. It's an extrapolation of your personality, but it's so high energy. And me being much more of an introvert, I think, She's got to be days where she wakes up and she's like, I really don't, I'm not up for it today. <laughs> and you got to go and do the thing, right? You got to do the thing. Uh, I definitely have days, but I love it. I am so charged by what I get to do every day. It's, 
insane. Like yeah. I, sometimes I'm like, wait, so they're just giving me a microphone. It, it's now that the scale is growing to what it is and it really is like a network. I'm like, wait, we're still doing this thing. Like you're uh-huh. going to mic me up and the red light goes on and we're just off. And that is really thrilling. How much prep do you put into what you're going to say, the playlist, like all that kind of stuff that goes into the classes? The playlist and the class plan are locked. So I will know, you know, exactly what I'm doing, especially in a class that is more fitness focused. If it's a hit class, if it's a Tabata class, I've been very prescriptive with that Mm -hmm. game plan. Um, In terms of messaging and talking points, that's always like 99% extemporaneous. Mm -hmm. I might have like bullets, like I want to talk about mental focus or I want to talk about grit. Or I'll be, I'll plug, or I'll mention like, remember this this story, to, you know, about X training, you know, moment. But it won't be that. That's it. That's uh-huh. as detailed as it gets. So for just me. get a little elevated heart rate, and it just you're in the flow. And flow, it just comes flow out. state. Yeah. I mean, the definition of flow state is is what I'm teaching. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever had a moment though where you just blanked? No, not really. No. No, I'm yeah. so focused. Yeah. I'm so um, hyper aware of everything that's going on. It's crazy how personal the relationship is between the participant and the instructor. Like every, I'm sure you've heard these stories a million times. Like, oh, you're my friend or you're the per, like I have, you know, my my deepest relationship is with my Peloton instructor. <laughs> Everybody has their favorite. Yes. You know, it's this weird, it is very much like a cultish thing. <laughs> it you is. Know? It is. Um, and now that the world is opening up again, you know, we were, Peloton instructors <clears throat> had lots of interactions with folks publicly pre-pandemic. Mm-hmm. But now that the world is opening up again, it's almost like people have this pent up emotion globally. And then when you see someone who you did have like intimate workout experiences with, you know, in your home when we were all collectively grieving and going through a lot the outpouring of emotion that happens nearly on a daily basis is pretty intense. Yeah. Like many, (laughs) many tears, many tears. Yeah. How does um, that make you feel? There's a vulnerability that is like kind of jarring in a way to be like in, in front of that kind of emotion is pretty intense, but also I I totally get it because I have used the bike and used my teammates' mm-hmm. classes truly to deal with a lot of heavy stuff. So I do, so I understand. Yeah, it's like you're the face, but it represents something bigger, which is that was a really hard year, two years, and this person helped me get through it by leading me through this routine that was so instrumental and kind of kept kept me grounded. And that Mm -hmm. is very emotional. So there's an intimacy to it, right? It's not like, it's different from a movie star, like, oh, wow, that I've seen that person on a huge screen and they're very good looking and charismatic versus like this, this person actually helped me. So I would suspect like it removes the creepy aspect of it. Maybe it's a little encroaching and, you know, boundary pushing a little bit, but at the same time, there's something so beautiful about it. It's largely beautiful. I mean, sometimes there's a little bit of like (laughs) boundaryless interaction (laughs) for sure. Um, But for the most part, it's really stunning to to witness. Yeah. Well, you're good with boundaries though. You're the queen queen of no. Let's let's talk about no a little bit. Like I'm still working on my nose. (laughs) I love no. No is my favorite word. Yeah. Yeah. I use my no to protect my yes. I say no to most things. And Mm. I am pretty famous for slashing. Like somebody tried to put a 90 minute calendar appointment on my calendar next week. And I was like, that's literally not going to happen ever. Mm -hmm. Like I'm maybe giving you 25 minutes. And it's, um, I really own my no to protect the yes. How do you know when it's a yes? What's the It's rule? a hell yes or it's a no thanks. Mm-hmm. If it doesn't feel like a hell yes, especially since becoming a mother, um, if something doesn't feel, doesn't feel like it's lighting me up, 
then it's a no. Yeah. And of course, there's the stuff like you, you pay your taxes, you do, you know, there's there's gr- stuff that is, doesn't feel great to do, but, but it's moving the needle. You're talking about like opportunities that come your way. And yeah. the bigger that you get, the cooler the opportunities are and the more tempting they are. And that, that hell yes, it can be there. It can be a hell yes, but also like, this is a distraction from yes. what I'm actually trying to do, or it's going to take me away from being a mother or those other things. That's when it gets really hard and confusing. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, do you want a first class ticket to go to Dubai and do this cool, you know, like you're like, yeah, I'd like to do that. But then you're like, yeah, that's really going to screw my stuff up. Like I probably shouldn't do that. Agree. It's hard. Mm-hmm. This is, these are problems of, of abundance. You know, these are problems sure. of privilege, of course, but I've experienced it and I'm not, is great with the, with the no. It's hard because I want to do all the cool stuff. Yeah, but you got to exercise. And then I spread myself thin and then I, then I like bottom out, I burn out and I have all these other problems. Oh my God, but that's so not <laughs> worth it. I, I, I think about my future, the future version. Like I think about the version of myself at the end of that journey as much as I, you know, to the extent that I can contemplate, you know, things that I haven't experienced yet. And I, and I think about, you know, the burnout version of myself that I I have so much grace and compassion for that version of myself. Um, Largely when I was doing like the 80 hour lawyer weeks, Mm -hmm. um, any element of that is like threatens who who I like it just shakes me to my core to even go back there and I love meaning hus- like when you were doing the the eighty hour weeks and not having agency over your time yeah it, there was a a powerlessness as well as just true fatigue you know and I love I do love hustling there is I feel like the pendulum has swung that now like hustle is a dirty word and people right. are like and I'm like where's your work ethic? Like, give me a friggin' break, you know? So you just have to be in, I I define hustle as grit and work ethic meeting your definition of success and purpose. And I think those two combined create a beautiful momentum. Mm -hmm. Um, But I don't have any, but I don't believe in redlining, obviously, and, and that no pain, no gain mentality is harmful. But we do have to have an element of grit and work ethic still. A hundred percent. So it's finding the balance. I think that pendulum has swung a little bit too far where it's like, don't hustle. Make sure that you're resting. It's like, look, sleep's important. Recovery, all these things are important. But a lot of the people that are over-indexing on that don't have any of the hustle to begin with and could use a little bit of that. Yeah, I don't, the listlessness, the like, the per the, the it's sort of rubber stamping or 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 permitting you to kind of be the lazy person that you have been historically. Yeah, if I, it's misused. It like makes me <laughs> break out into hives. Like I actually cannot. <laughs> I can't. I can't. I can't. <laughs> so what is the you know I know you hate this word balance, but like how, what is the fulcrum point on that for you? Like it's changed. I want to talk about you being a mother, but obviously you know, being a mother to, to an infant, you know, changes that equation quite a bit. I just, I don't believe in balance. I don't believe that. Okay. I think balance is a harmful concept when we perceive it to be an even Steven, that like everything gets the same percentage of your 24 hour day or or whatever that hundred percent of you is in the world. Um, there isn't going to be balance. I mean, there are some days where I'm feeling like, you know, I'm giving 20% to my marriage and my husband's giving the 80%. And then there are some days where it feels more 50-50. And then there are some days, you know, the, you you have to show up in alignment with what's important to you. Mm-hmm. And I guess that is a more palatable definition of balance to me is what is my short list of values and what's important. And so that goes back to like the hell yes or the no thank you is that if you know, a, a business opportunity is coming my way or a philanthropic thing that's pulling at my heartstrings. Like if it's really not moving the needle on the short list of things that is, that's important to me. And the top of that is certainly my family and my daughter, um, you know, protecting, protecting that time. The stuff that I am devoted to professionally has got to light me up and make me feel like a superhero. Yeah. The balance thing is, is tough because I think it, it, it ends up 
shaming people because everybody's walking around measuring themselves against some idealized notion of how everything should fit on on the daily. Mm-hmm. And I just don't believe anybody, particularly people who who excel in their lives, are are living up to that themselves. So I like to think of it as being completely present for whatever it is that you're doing and giving it your all and then toggling out of it and making sure that all of those buckets over an extended period of time are being filled, but understanding and being okay with them, not being you know, on, on an equal level of waterline on a daily basis or even a weekly basis or even a monthly basis sometimes, depending upon how immersive a certain project or, or you know, kind of thing that you're pushing forward involves. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think people understand er- energy to be currency. Like if we had currency meters, you know, of our energetic exchanges, you know, whether it's the person in your family that you're like, oh gosh, so-and-so is really uh-huh. just like an energy vampire. Think what is that expenditure costing you? And what value are you putting on your own vibrancy and buoyancy and how are you centering experiences that reward and 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 really allow you to increase that energetic currency that bank account right like there should be an app with a thing on your like that 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 (laughs) measures that right yes And and then there's like graphs you know it's like you devoted this much energy to your in-laws. Yeah. This, this, you devoted this much energy to Netflix, you know, yes. and, then, and color code them based upon your values. Like, so red would be bad, you know. Like, <laughs> I wish. And then you could be like, wow, what am I doing with how I'm expending my energy? But, but the better, but we have that, right? When we listen to our intuition and when we listen to, like, we have that innately, but we're very distracted. And we sometimes we don't like the answer to that mm-hmm. intuition. Right. Right. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. You have to really be calibrated internally to have that level of self-awareness. Yeah. Because I think we all just kind of do it and we don't, we don't concentrate enough on, on what that actually looks like. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's a cool idea. Well, let's talk about being a mom. I mean, this is the big thing that's happened to you over the last year. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank Athena. you. I've yet to meet her. She is <laughs> Drew dropped you off, right? He's coming back. Is this Athena is our with him? first or you're trip. Away? Wow. This is our first trip away together. What are you doing in LA, by the way? I'm going to Coachella and I had meetings. Uh, okay, yeah. So I had cool. some night meetings in LA, business stuff, and uh-huh. then Coachella, mom and dad are going to be out away. in these streets. Yeah. How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Um, I love being a mom. Athena is a cool human. Like she's just exudes a level of cool that is really humbling. I mean, she's just a cool, cool human. I love being her mom. It's all, it's felt very intuitive to be honest. I want to say that it's been, um, I mean, honestly, it's been kind of easy. Like, I guess I shouldn't say easy, simple, straightforward. Mm -hmm. Like it's like, that's my kid. And, that's my husband and that's my family and it feels good. And how do you think about, like, have you developed uh, an evolving philosophy of, of motherhood and on that subject of, of balance or anti-balance, um, how do you think about continuing to pursue your dreams and your goals while also you know, being the mother that you wanna be mm-hmm. and making all of that work? I am more ambitious now as a mom, I think. And I was pretty ambitious before Athena. The, this real, I mean, goes back to some of the things we already talked about. Like I am unapologetic with my no. And I have boundaries that, like I will not do meetings, executive meetings or otherwise with my agents after five o'clock. Like I won't, I put my phone, like I don't have notifications on my phone. I don't, like the thing I use as best I can, you know, the tools in my toolkit as tools. Mm -hmm not as tethers. So, and I've gotten pretty, even more intentional about that stuff since becoming a mom. I also refuse to be a martyr to an antiquated idea of motherhood. Explain that. That I need to be all things to all people, that I need to wear every hat all at once. I choose in any given moment 
what my primary identity is. And that's not always Athena's mom. It's not always Drew's wife. It's not always an executive at Peloton. It's not always an author, right? I'm, I'm going to choose what piece of myself I'm utilizing and presenting to the world. Mm-hmm. And yeah, a lot of times, especially in the last year, it's been Athena's mom and that's amazing, but I'm choosing when that is. Yeah. Um, how does it work? Like speaking strictly about fitness, like walk me through the prenatal phase and how you thought about your fitness and now postnatal, like how you've approached it, whether it's different or has changed based upon pre-mama, peace, mm. pre-strong mama Robin. <laughs> Prenatal. Okay. So I trained and I taught five days a week live throughout my entire pregnancy. Uh huh. <clears throat> and only then everyone like fell in love with you because you were like, this is like, oh, she's preg- pregnant. Like they, there was an emotional bond, I think, that you created with the people that care about you. Well, I announced the on pregnancy Peloton. on the bike. So that it, <laughs> yeah. it was like a very major, you know, uh, pregnancy announcement. But that was, that felt very logical to me because I have sh- shared, you know, parts of my life, whether it's my romantic journey or my, you know, of course, as an athlete and as a woman, as a Latina, like there are aspects of myself that I, that I infuse into my, into my training and my workouts. Um, And so announcing the pregnancy felt logical, especially because I knew I was going to teach, you know, was hoped to teach throughout my pregnancy. And I, and I had a great pregnancy, so that was possible. And I, you know, I continued to run, strength train, and cycle throughout. I did, um, I got my prenatal certification. So I did prenatal classes as well for Peloton. And that felt, I was like, oh, I got this. Postpartum, however, that piece of the journey was daunting. Mm -hmm. Um, It felt like putting myself back together again. I wouldn't, I, I just wasn't used to slowing down to that extent and being that vulnerable and having no control. I mean, just, there were so many days that the fatigue was crushing. I, um, you know, I was recovering from a C-section. So you have major abdominal surgery. And there were, I mean, for probably the first six weeks, I was like, oh my God, am I ever going to be moved yeah. the way I'm used to moving? Um, and the pressure <clears throat> of being yeah. this celebrity fitness personality. And what if I can't do that again or be that person that I want to be or know how to be? I had, it, it was... I had I I had real moments of imposter syndrome, especially when you know we we are run like a network. So I took five months of maternity leave, but when we were planning for me to come back, they're like, you know, production's like, what do you want to teach? You know, mm-hmm. we, we have to put something on the live schedule for X day. And I'm like, I don't even physically know what I'm going to be able to do. You know, mm-hmm. it that felt really intense, and I developed a mantra then during that postpartum period of consistency over intensity because I knew I couldn't go hard in the paint, which is I'm apt to do. Like yeah. that is much more my <laughs> flavor of intensity. And I thought, just do something every day. And in the beginning, it was literally breath work, like literally feeding my daughter and doing 360 diaphragmatic breathing because I knew mm-hmm. that was you know going to repair my core. That was weeks of that. And then it was walks and you know, little by little amounting to a lot but it was frustratingly slow. And now I'm stronger than I ever have been, you know, a year, a year later. I'm right. And, and how much of that did you share transparently in the Peloton classes? Because I feel like that on some level is much more relatable to the typical Peloton person than all the talk about polishing your crowns and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, hey, I don't feel like, you know, most of the time I feel like I can barely do anything. And now Robin can speak my language or I can find a relatability there that that perhaps even strengthened your connection with your community. Definitely. I was, I was super honest, especially in those first few classes back, you know, in that, in that six month period, my first six months back on the bike and back in strength classes, it, you know, I'd already been doing my own training before, you know, during my maternity leave, mm-hmm. but it was, it's different. It's different during in front of the camera that for, you know, those first few sprints <laughs> feel yeah. like, am I ever going to get it back? But your body does remember. And I think being honest about that journey, especially as a woman, um, 
and very anti-snapback culture. You yeah, know? I want to talk about that because there is all this pressure, like how quickly can you get back to where you were before? And your whole thing is about letting go of what was before and let's focus on moving forward. Yeah. And I really, <laughs> my refrain was, what if a plateau is a launching pad? What if a plateau is a launching pad? And for a really long time, um, I still wasn't fitting into, you know, cl- you know, like the, the like I'm supposed to wear the new Peloton collection and I'd uh-huh. have to go back and be like, I actually still need this other size, you know? And I had to tell my, reframe the story around that and focus on what my body could do rather than, you know, what, what size the tag said. Sure. And it's all good now though. I feel strong. I'm stronger back. than ever. Yeah. And I, but it was little by little amounting to a lot. I mean, it was truly like, the smallest steps. I remember runs on the West Side Highway. Just, I trained for the, I, tra- I ran the New York City Marathon um, about, I, th- I think Athena was nine months. And I didn't, when I tell you that I didn't look at a watch, I would old school like map the distance for my runs mm-hmm. and not run with a single stitch of like pacing. Yeah. Because I couldn't even, I, I couldn't even take that information. You know, I couldn't right. be like, oh, but your pace was this. And then no way. I showed up to the New York City Marathon actually having zero idea how long it was going to take me. Right. Like I was just like, but it's I'm going to go. it's liberating that way. It was so liberating. And it was a night, it was, it was a, it was a refreshing back to basics. Like mm-hmm. it was like, I'm doing this because I love it. And because I, I feel better doing it rather than any external gaze. Yeah. I shared a little thing about this on Instagram the other day you know, my version of that is just getting older and dealing with injuries. You know, it's a limited version of, of what you experienced on an extreme level, but at some point the GPS watches and all the stuff are no longer tools, but they're vehicles to shame yourself. Right. And, and at that point they're counterproductive and I've been spending more time like letting go of all of that stuff. And what it does is it, it does, it does exactly what you said, which is it reminds you why you're doing it, which Mm -hmm. is that it's brings your, yourself joy, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's really the most important thing. So rather than like looking, you know, where am I at? It's impossible to look at that and not immediately measure yourself against the fittest version of yourself, which is a really unkind, unfair thing to do to yourself. It was so, I mean, I I noticed myself doing that and I did do runs on the Peloton tread and it was, thank God I had it because I literally during nap time, I'd like I cobbled, I don't even know how I did cross that finish line, but I cobbled together. Like I'm talking like 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon. And Uh that would be my run, you know, when I was supposed to run five miles that day. Like it was not (laughs) as I would have, I would have had done it in past marathon training cycles. But the most important catalyst was not crossing that finish line. It was how I was talking to myself along the way. Um, and talk more about that. It was um, okay. So I'll do so pre run, putting on a pair of pants that were bigger than I have ever trained in before, uh-huh. right? Go out, lace up, finish that 10 mile run, finish that 13 mile run, come back kinder to myself because I completed what I said I was going to do, even if it took me however much longer than previous versions. And um, it actually brought me back. So I, when I started running after, after I was held hostage and I started, and was, started running during law school, I was, it was the first time I was made aware of my internal conversation of like the actual thoughts, whether it was like in first person or third person mm-hmm. that were going on in between my ears. And I was brought back to that in that training cycle postpartum as my ability to either use the words to cast, what kind of spell am I going to cast with the words that are going on internally? And it was either going to be, I had a choice. Like, are you going to berate yourself for the size of these pants? Or are you going to tell yourself, oh my God, like you are outside. You have, your husband's able to watch the baby. She's healthy. Like you're healed enough from this post C-section to even lace up. You know, you were craving to even get outdoors, you know? So there was an element of gratitude and kindness that I had to incorporate into that training cycle and it ended up being the best four months of training of Mm. my life. Yeah, it's a choice, right? But sometimes it's hard to make that choice. Like, is there a mental 
trick or tactic that you would deploy to get out of that negative headspace and and inhabit that more positive gratitude oriented perspective? Yeah, I would often ask myself, what do you have right now that you used to dream about or pray for? And in the like specifics, it was like just last week, you couldn't even go three miles. Right. So <laughs> you better be grateful that you can even run an hour today, you know? Um, and there was, yeah, that, that actually is my like internal, that asking myself that question is like an internal reset. Like I, I remember the beginning of the pandemic during quarantine, I was just my, I was pregnant during the pandemic and it felt the walls felt like they were closing in some points, you know, for all of us. Mm -hmm. And I started that as a, as a journaling practice, but I would force myself to answer, you know, what is it that you used to dream about or wish for that you have right now, but like within these four walls, like, and then I, notice like, oh, there, there's that painting that I got at whatever trip, or there's, you know, the couch that I bought with my husband, you know, little things that I was able to kind of put that gratitude filter yeah. on that it really helps. It, initially, I mean, there were, of course, there were some days that I was like, God, this feels cheesy, but the practice of it um, really helped ground me and anchor me. And was that journaling practice part of what birthed the children's book? No. So I, so I've been journaling, um, for years. And that is my, whether it's processing training or whether it's listing gratitude stuff or whether it's just a brain dump journal journaling really helps is like, keeps me like, a, definitely it's like a, a processing thing, like an emotional processing thing. The children's book, strong mama. Um, I was on my baby moon and I just finished a, what does that mean? Your baby, baby moon. moon. So it's like a little mini vacation that, that folks take, you know, during pregnancy. Oh, okay. I never um, heard that term. Baby yeah, moon. baby moon. So instead of a honeymoon, it's a baby moon. Uh, and so we were like on before our- Before the baby comes. Like, before the baby comes, last, it's right, like a it. couple's yeah. weekend or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so that's exactly what it was. We, we went on a long weekend to Connecticut and like rented a cabin. And the, oh, the place where we were staying had um, like a hotel gym. And I had taken a boot camp class with my girl Jess Sims on the Peloton app. And I had gotten back to the cabin and I was like hormonal, filled with endorphins, feeling all kinds of feelings. And that's when the book poured out of me. And it was really like a love letter to the baby, which we called Pequeño at the time, little one in Spanish. And that's how Strong Mama came to be. Mm, and did you know it to be a children's book while you were kind of channeling this? I did, had yeah. You thought I, you would you were gonna write a children's book? Well, <laughs> this had already been so that we had had discussions with my agent of like, would you consider this? Would you write a children's book? And I was like, yeah, maybe. And then we, we went on the baby moon and I was like, well, actually, yeah, sure. I, yeah, maybe turned into yes, because here it is. <laughs> but we right. didn't have an illustrator at the time. I had no idea what I mean, these were just the words. Uh-huh. And that became, you know, the framework. Yeah. And then it became a New York Times bestseller, right? It's like so <laughs> yeah. crazy. It is crazy. Two it is times crazy. New York Times bestseller. I just submitted the manuscript for children's book number two. Oh, wow. Yeah. What's that one called? Strong Baby. Strong Baby. Strong, Strong Baby. Of course. It's called, yeah. <laughs> come on. So Strong Baby will come out in 2023. Uh huh. That's so cool. Um, let's talk about the masterclass that you did. This is like so perfectly suited for you. Like just watching the trailer, it's, you're so relaxed and you're so in your Dharma doing this. Like it's such a natural fit and a great kind of like um, context for you to share all this wisdom that you share, you know, on the daily, on the bike that kind of just spontaneously comes out of you and, and all of these pithy, you know, quotes <laughs> that end yeah. up, you know, all over the internet. <laughs> well, it, it was cool to, um, you know, I'm a student of masterclass. I've taken a bunch of masterclass, they're masterclasses. I mean, they're they're incredible. So excellently rendered. Um, they're super well done. They're very well curated. Um, the team is incredible to work with. Uh, yeah. So when masterclass approached me, I was like, it was no brainer, of mm. course. And how does it work? Like I'm, I've watched a bunch of them. They're all so well done. And clearly they try to get, I'm sure they have different directors for these, but they get the the protagonist like very relaxed and it feels very natural and spontaneous like how much of it is really scripted i'm sure you put a ton of work into 
you know, figuring out what it is that you wanted to say in the order in which you wanted to say it. Well, when we filmed it, all of the pre, all of the work was already done. So it's a lot of interviews before you're even on set. It's interviews kind of developing the table of contents. Mm -hmm. It's, and figuring out like, if you were to create chapters of your body of work, what would that look like? It was, so it was almost like creating a book, a book proposal, right? And like uh -huh. creating sections within like a table of contents of a hefty book proposal. But because I knew it was going to be in a Q and A format, they're really just creating that framework in the initial conversations of like, oh, okay, this will be a chapter on your story. And then this will be a chapter on how you have developed confidence and how you've developed, you know, mental resilience in like these different areas. Um, and then when you're on set, it's just a conversation with, with, with the director. Mm. Mm. So they actually make it very fluid. Well, it's wonderful. What is the, what are some of the core concepts that are shared in the class? Well, it is a lot about my story. So there's a lot a lot that lives in my book, Shut Up and Run, that is then in this kind of conversation that, that a masterclass student gets to witness. And it's everything from my journaling practice. So, so basically it's, I reveal my superhero toolkit. Mm -hmm. And in that toolkit, of course, is movement, journaling, visualization practice, vision boarding, um, everything from, you know, kind of, identifying your superheroes and with specificity, as well as um, owning your no to protect your yes, you know, using your words as a wand to cast a, a magic spell. You know, the way, the framework with which I applied not only my career transition, but, you know, conquering marathons and ultra marathons. And, and it's getting, it's like if you unzipped my head and um, tried to unpack mental resiliency, that's what I infused into my masterclass. We'll be back in a sec, but first, if you dig this podcast, and I hope you dig this podcast, then I think you'll really enjoy my latest book, Voicing Change, featuring excerpts from poignant essays by and glorious photography of some 50 of my favorite guests over the last eight plus years of doing this thing, this podcast. It's a gorgeous, artful compendium of the show and copious wisdom shared therein, all wrapped in a hardcover coffee table form that provides a great taste of what we do here at the RRP and serves as a beautiful keepsake or gift for the ardent fan. The book is only and exclusively available on our website, signed copies are available and we are shipping globally direct to any coffee table on planet earth. So to learn more and snag your copy today, visit richroll.com slash VC. That's richroll.com slash VC. All right, let's get back into it. What is the thing that's, that's challenging you the most right now or really putting those tools to the test? For me personally? Yeah. Probably my, my web three strategy. Like right now it's, it's right just, now. I, right, hold on a second. First of all, I'm just like, wait, you have a web three strategy. Like I'm immediately like, should I have a web three strategy? <laughs> what well, is a web three strategy? Exactly. <laughs> that is my question. You know, I mean, I guess right now I'm in a season of, um, asking myself like, do I have the same values as pre-Athena? Like what is on your short list of important business opportunities? Mm -hmm. Like who or what is on your wish list of what you want to work on next? Like I am now, I have realized a number of the things that were dream, dreams of mine. And now I'm in a different stage of my career, a different stage of like a lot of the seeds that I planted are have germinated, <laughs> you know? So now it's like, I'm having those introspective conversations. You know, for the, I feel like for the last few years, it was just get the work done. And now I'm in a place where I'm more in a more creative place again. Mm -hmm. And um, that actually is harder for me than just like hustling and getting getting the work done. Because you've, so, you've arrived at this place that you aspire to inhabit. Right. So what does that mean in terms of what's next? 
Exactly. Yeah. And I don't do as well having achieved the thing. I'd rather be in the process to achieving sure. the thing. Yeah. So. And does there have to be a next thing? Great question. You know, I mean, that's um, one of I the mean, things. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt I you. think. I want to say that there doesn't have to be a next thing, mm -hmm. but I would be completely full of shit. Yeah. You're too ambitious <laughs> for that. I mean, one of the things that I found is, you know, I'm further along. I'm older than you. My kids are, are older. Um, people ask me like, what's the big vision? Like, what are you working towards? And sometimes I feel guilty because I don't have a good answer for that. But the truth is like, I'm good. Like I have ambitions and I have projects that I want to see realized and things that I'm working on, but I'm actually really happy doing what I'm doing right now. Like mm -hmm. I feel very fulfilled and in a healthy way, I don't need my life to be any different than it is right now. Mm. And sometimes I judge myself um, for that because I too am, am, am an ambitious competitive person. But I think there's something healthy about that. Like it doesn't, I'm not doing this to get to somewhere else. I'm doing this much like leaving the GPS watch at home. Like I'm doing this for the joy of doing it. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, if this is all that it is, like it's pretty fucking great. Yeah. You know, and I'm really, I worked really hard to get here. I'm very grateful to have this platform and the opportunity to talk to people like you. And, and it's okay if it's never anything bigger or more grand than what it is right now, because it's pretty fucking awesome as it is. I can relate to that, at, you know, as it, for, for, I feel that way about Peloton. You know, when I'm on that bike, I'm like, I don't need this to be different. Like I mm -hmm. love this piece of what I, how I serve the world. But then I also think, what are other ways that I can be expanding into who I am? And whether that's licensing and product iterations, whether that's different platforms that I'm going to partner with, different brands, mm -hmm. different investments. You know, I'm now, you know, Web3 is an example of like just my brain melting into different ideas. Um, so it's both exciting and also terrifying. Yeah, because the thing is, those opportunities are there and you could immerse yourself or run down a bunch of different alleyways towards those things. But ultimately they end up, they end up draining your energy, yep. right? So it has to be worth it because otherwise it is taking time away from those other values that, that you cherish. And what do you want your life to look like on a daily basis? Like how manageable or how much agency do you wanna have over your time? And if you get involved with too many things, mm -hmm. they might all be individually very cool and, and reward you financially, et cetera. But ultimately, if you're just spread so thin in the pursuit of those things, you're losing sight of the most important thing, which is the quality time with the people that you care about and making sure that you have the energy for the things that are most important to you. Yeah. And I think, you know, the analysis, sometimes, you know, it is like analysis by paralysis or paralysis by analysis. Sometimes that it's, I'm like, what is the risk? What's the reward? But if it's a totally new venture and I have no, you know, the newness is what's exciting, mm. but that, but then the newness is also where I get completely paralyzed because I don't actually know whether that, that venture is worth it, both financially, energetically, or right. otherwise. Right. You know? So the Web3 thing, I mean, what does that mean? Like NFTs of, of Robin? <laughs> like, I don't even understand. Well, what it's what, um, you know, we're still, I'm still developing the strategy around it, but I, you know, it's, I'm a digital creator and it's how, how will I create digitally in web three? You know, it's, I'm, I want to stay away from anything that feels gimmicky where it's just like a piece of art that mm -hmm. I want to, that I sell on OpenSea just to say I did that. I really want to create community and, and think about what is an inspired engagement with Web3. I also feel really strongly about having a female presence in Web3. It's very male dominated, mm -hmm. especially it's pretty much white male dominated. And I want to, as I'm educating myself, I'm thinking how will, how can I create, build bridges? So folks that follow me, especially women and people of color, can also feel like they're being educated. Right. So, you know, it goes back to that toolkit. I'm developing my own toolkit. I'm develop I'm educating myself around basic terminology, like what is crypto? What is a non-fungible token, you know? And um, along that process, I'm really, you know, 
trying to consider who are the right partners in this space and how am I going to build community in this new land grab? Yeah, that's fascinating. I feel like now I should be thinking more about this. Like, what are your sources of, of information on this? Like, who are you going to to learn about this? Well, Drew is very, pretty well-versed. Mm -hmm. He has been involved in crypt crypto and Bitcoin for <clears throat> a few years. Mm -hmm. And so he's, it's actually really neat because for the first time we're, we're working together in ways that it now feel faded, but like oh, didn't cool. feel, didn't feel timely before. And now, now it's the time. Yeah. Um, let's talk about life pivots. We're both recovering corporate lawyers. I think you have a, a greater fondness for your legal career than perhaps I did. <laughs> yeah. um, but people look at you as this inspiration for changing your life and and constantly iterating on, on your path. And I'm sure people come to you all the time and say, I'm unhappy in my chosen career or I'm looking for a change. Like, how did you do it? I really... I did a three-part, I only now understand this as an, a three-part audit, but, but I did a three-part audit when I was a lawyer. So I realized that I was falling in love, I had fallen in love with running and movement, and it was a two-year journey from, from that mm. ideation phase to, to the departure phase. Uh, and I did, in those two years, I did a three-part audit. I would say one was a physical audit of like, how am I feel, feeling in my physical body? Like energy is currency. Like how can I capitalize on the energy that I'm feeling and, and what are the avenues and the tools that I am, am feeling more filled with energy? Then the second was a more existential question of like, and I had a lot of this, especially in my 20s after the hostage situation of like, what am I doing? Why am I here? Why did I survive? Who am I? Um... And then the third was a very brass tax, like financial audit of how the hell do am I going to pay my rent in New York City and how can I continue to, how can mm -hmm. I not move in, you know, with my parents um, and still be, you know, financially stable? And what skill set am I going to leverage in order to make sure that I'm still employable, yeah. you know, when I'm not doing what my degree says I should be doing? On the second prong of that audit, the, the whole like, who am I? Yeah. yeah. Like, how do you begin to unpack and answer that? That's where journaling really came into the picture. And journaling, vision boards, um, and honestly, social media. Like the storytelling and the scrapbook nature that I was a, that I approached social media with, um, even during like Tumblr days and gosh, I don't even know what other platforms. Yeah, um, MySpace. I did have a MySpace. Yeah. I had a Friendster. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was. Um, but I think gosh. it's important to point that out because people have, in you know, through the rearview mirror, people have a very condensed idea of what the timeline looked like, mm -hmm. right? Like you were well along this journey when I met you, and that was like, was that like I don't know, eight years ago or something like that? Yeah. Nine years ago. Yeah, eight and or you nine. Were, you had already been at it for quite a, few, a number of for a years. Few years. And this mm -hmm. is something I'm always reminding people about my own story. Like this. These things don't happen. I mean, overnight is an absurd notion. It's, we're, you know, decades for me yeah. of constantly growing and trying to figure this out and doing it imperfectly and incorrectly and inelegantly. And your initial move out of the law was really as a journalist. Yes. I, I thought I was gonna... Well, because I think it's human nature to go to the frameworks that are already existing. And I thought, okay, if I know how to write and I love sports, sure. then obviously I'm just going to go write for a yeah, sports that's magazine. Strength as a write as a as a lawyer, you know how to write. You have this love for running. It's not immediately apparent how that's going to translate into anything that's going to pay your rent. <laughs> right. You know. <laughs> right. You're not going to win the New York Marathon, and even <laughs> if you did, that would probably barely pay your rent. You know? Exactly. Like, There's no longevity yeah. in that. Like how how does this whole thing scale? And what was, the, that was the question of asking myself, how does this scale? I put on my vision board, disruptive technology. And then I read about Peloton, mm. a blurb about Peloton and Fast Company. And it was not even like a 200 word blurb. It was like on the sidebar. And I thought, oh, and that for me was the, how the vision board vision boards help is that they enable you to name it and claim it. Mm -hmm. And I think I would have glossed right by that 
blurb if I hadn't planted the seed that I wanted some type of disruptive technology, you know, to partner with. Yeah, that's interesting. And so did you just cold call? Like how did that cold email. relationship develop? I sent an email to like info at. Wow. <laughs> and I had been teaching cycling at a local spin studio in New York City. And then I read about Peloton and I, and I just looked it up on the internet and I info at, there were like 20 employees at the time. And mm. I was like, let's do this. Mm. Like I am your chick. And they said, yes. <laughs> wow. So when people come to you and say, say, I'm looking at, at, you know, trying to make some version of your life pivot, journaling, what else do you tell them? I think the three most relevant questions, the three most relevant questions that I asked myself during that transition period and still continue to ask myself why not me? You know, like we tend to other people's greatness instead of understanding that in the kaleidoscope of how we see things, what if that greatness is being refracted as potential? Like now I see somebody else's greatness as a potential of my own, not in a apples to apples comparison, of course, necessarily, but as potential. So ask your, I ask folks, ask yourself, why not me? And the second question that I've asked myself, which we talked about a little, was like, what is my why? I do believe like identifying that with as much specificity as possible and acknowledging that sometimes that's going to change in different seasons is freeing. I give myself permission to change my mind as a stubborn individual, as a stubborn Virgo former lawyer that is incredibly mm -hmm. freeing to give myself permission to change my mind. And um, the third most exciting question is what decision would I make if I were twice as confident and twice as strong? And Ooh, that, that's a good one. That one I asked myself a lot, especially postpartum. It was like, what decision would I make if I were twice as confident? And that actually is a, is a nice tool against imposter syndrome too. Mm -hmm. It's kind of an alter ego exercise. Yes. And I love... I love like the lore around superheroes and stuff like that. And I think it's, and actually this is related to web three is like what that's that level of enchantment, I think is really exciting of like, you know, I do talk a lot about royalty and polishing crowns. And I think, you know, there's a level of like self-determination and imbuing respect when you call someone a king or queen or non-binary royalty. And there is a, there, there is like an other version of myself that I try to honor, um, whether you call it an avatar, mm -hmm. or a, you know, an alter ego. Um, and what is it, what, when you conjure that, what does that look like in your mind? Like she is regal. She has earned jewels in her crown through grit. And um, I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like a version of myself that is otherworldly, but like she's on a throne, honey, and don't play with her. Mm -hmm. And I, I really think about that version of myself or that imagined version of myself often. And I'm creating a kingdom with my husband and Athena is gonna be a part of that, but I also want right. her to like- Appropriately earn her named, you know, in the goddess vernacular. Yeah, but I also <laughs> want her to be able to earn, earn and define her own way, you know? So that's an interesting thing that I'll navigate as she gets older, mm -hmm. but yeah. Mm. Um, another big piece of that that you talk about is being unapologetic. Mm -hmm. But that is befitting of a queen, right? Or of, or of royalty. Yeah, well- I've learned to use my voice even when it's shaky, like use it and you, you'll find your people. Um, and you know, that paired with having enough confidence to know when you should have done better, you know? I think um, using your voice, even when it shakes, and having an, an ability to admit when you're wrong and change your mind are lethal combinations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then not fearing other people's success, which we talked about earlier. Yeah, I, find yeah. it, I find it totally intoxicating and palpable when somebody is 
Like step into your power, like polish your crown, baby. Like that just means that I am surrounded by royalty. That excites me. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about uh, the T1. That's another yeah. big piece in your story, being type one diabetic. Um, you're healthy, everything's good, right? Yeah, thank With goodness. your health and stuff mm -hmm. as, yeah. as regards to that. Um, I've been um, playing around with a, a, a CGM. Oh, cool. Uh, through levels and it's been really interesting. And I've thought of you often as, I do, as I'm like checking my blood yeah. glucose because I know we've, we, you know, you, yeah. we go to dinner and you're kind of, I'm like, why is she so distracted? And it's like, no, you're checking, as you're doing right I now. I am like doing right now, yeah. Your, I like how it's on the Apple Watch. Um, but it's been really interesting to see that relationship between the foods that I'm eating and how it's impacting um, that, 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 um, that graph of mm -hmm. blood glucose going up, going down. When does it plateau? What really spikes it? What doesn't? How does sleep, rest, recovery, training, all these other lifestyle habits impact that? Which yep. that's probably been the most revelatory. It's like, obviously, if you eat something that's you know high in simple carbohydrates, it's gonna do this. I've also noticed that foods that are higher in fat will do yes. the same thing, like yes. all these. And I think it's, I think the danger with this is that people who aren't steeped in the science can make very binary reductive conclusions from that data. I think the truth is probably much more complex, but as somebody who's, you know, been dealing with this condition that you have for a very long time and is very schooled on, you know, how these CGMs work and all of that, like, what have you learned about yourself and how do you think like th this kind of technology could be helpful for somebody who doesn't suffer from type one? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I mean, yeah, body awareness is key. I'm very grateful that I was already plant-based and I was already an athlete when I was diagnosed. So there's a level of self-awareness that I already had going into my uh -huh. type one diagnosis. And then I just told myself, I'm going to continue to run these finish lines. I'm across these finish lines. I'm going to continue to lift weights. I'm going to continue to teach a Peloton. Like actually I was just on the eve of teaching a Peloton when I was diagnosed. And this it's the time is different now because now there's lots of, there's an acceptance of this. But when you were starting, I know that people thought that that was inadvisable or, or perhaps even very dangerous. Oh, I was told yeah. you're not going to run ultras anymore. Like you're, how are you going to be able to teach in front of a camera and mm -hmm. not having to go like like they, the, the doctors couldn't even contemplate me teaching in front of millions of people and not having to like pause the class to leave and do uh -huh. whatever um which knock on wood has never happened um the yeah the, i mean the technology helps a lot so i have a dexcom g6 and i loop that um basically you're cre you create like a a bridge um through an app and through this bluetooth device that links the um the blood sugar device mm -hmm. with an insulin distribution system right and you can just refresh it every couple minutes or whatever and you can kind of see pretty much in real time what's happening you're seeing the numbers in real time but i'm also administering i'm administering like the device the algorithm is administering the insulin based on the settings right. that so I give it. So it's reading it and deciding how much, if and when the insulin gets right. right from the device on your arm. Right. Right. Yeah, and that helps hugely. And I I approach my care like a, like I, I, I was like, I can either resist and get frustrated or I can get curious. And I just got really freaking curious mm -hmm. about everything from like, if I work out at this time and I eat this, like, this portion of my smoothie before this type of workout. And I now I kind of, <laughs> I know how to like move the needle. You know, those all those little nuances matter so much. Yeah, and, and, and they're gonna be very specific to you yeah, as an individual yeah. and also very differentiated because you have type one. What's interesting now is that there's, there's adoption of, you know, the, a version of this device. Obviously yep. it's not injecting you with insulin, but- um, with mainstream people. And, and I think there's a portion of, of society that is frowning upon this. Like these are, these, this, this thing is intended for people with diabetes, right? Like this shouldn't be being used by mainstream people. And then the counterpoint being like, hey, all information is good. This is gonna help us make better decisions. We're gonna get these massive data sets. We're gonna better understand 
how foods and lifestyle habits are impacting blood glucose, which is really important in helping people prevent themselves from getting type two or other lifestyle illnesses. For sure. It's a massive biomarker. I mean, I don't, unless the, the former criticism is presuming that having wide, that, that type of technology widely available somehow inhibits or prevents type ones from having access to it. I don't see the issue. It's like, Right, unless there's a supply chain problem. You're right. Unless I think part of the criticism also is is what I referenced earlier that people who don't really understand will make really reductive uh, conclusions about you know sort of you know A plus B equals C when that's probably not really the case, and then sort of saying, well, this is the case, so here's how I need to eat, or here's what this is happening because of this, where you know it's probably a much more complex you know. Uh, physiological mechanism than what is revealed by a simple graph. Sure. But you could say that about anything. Sure. You could say that about the sleep trackers. You could say, that, I mean, literally any of this biometric data, you could be making reductive decisions that aren't nuanced. Mm. But I, I think that we can use this data. Um, I, w- I, I would love for people to more, be more intentional about their food choices and, and see how their bodies are reacting. Most people don't understand that you shouldn't feel like you were hit by a truck and you're so lethargic and fatigued every day at three o'clock after you've had lunch, you know? And it's like, if that help, if that data point helps people understand that, then great. Yeah. And being able to see like, oh man, like I feel that way because here's this and like, oh, it's taking me a long time to get back up here. The other day I ate this and I bounced back more quickly. Like all of these are are really helpful, I think. I I think it's potentially transformative technology when it's sort of adopted at scale, which I think will happen at some point. Definitely, especially if people can, and and I mean, listen, diabetes, especially type two is an epidemic. If, it, if we can yeah. prevent folks from reaching that point like of crisis. 50% of, of, of Americans are gonna be diabetic or pre-diabetic by like 2050, it's yeah. insane. It's pretty, it's pretty terrifying. So we need to do something and we can start with that education tool. I agree. Yeah. Um, what else do we wanna talk about? Let's talk about, um, a day in the life. What's a day in the life look for, like for you now? It's, it's a little bit different than last time we talked. <laughs> it's a little, a little different. more complicated. Um, yeah, I wake Listen, up. I got four, so, you know, but they're older now. It's easy. <laughs> it's inc- <laughs> four, it's incredible. Um, day in the life. So I wake up, uh, I used to wake up and meditate. Now I wake up and feed Athena. Mm-hmm. Um, we got to wake up in the night too, right? I used Pump to. So now, kind of now she, now she sleeps through the night and I don't, Need to pump during the night, mm. but I'll wake up um, she around sleeps through the night. She sleeps You're through lucky. the night. Put her down at six thirty. She wakes up at six thirty. Wow, it's pretty remarkable. I'm very yeah, grateful. That is, that's like you won the lottery. With <laughs> I, that. I know I did. I know I won yeah. the lottery there. So wake up, feed Athena. Um, mornings in our house are really sacred. So it's like we play music. We it's family time for you know ninety minutes, um, and then. My husband will take the baby, you know, feed her. <laughs> she has a plant-based smoothie in the morning um, for breakfast. So do I, actually the whole family has the same plant-based yeah, smoothie. And you're still on the plant-based diet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's working for you. Love it. Good. Like most of my family members are now plant-based. Yeah. So wow. it's, it's cool to see. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> it's spread a little bit. Did um, people tell you that you, sh- you should modify that when you were pregnant? Um, and how is the experience of, of being plant-based through pregnancy? Because I think that's something a lot of plant curious or even plant-based people think about um, women when they get pregnant, like, hey, yeah. I, maybe I need more iron or I mean, need more of this. And I, obviously everybody, nobody wants to do anything that would be harmful to their Yeah, baby. of course. Well, I think because I was already a plant-based athlete, it answered a lot of those questions. So I already had blood work to understand like, what, what are my vitamin D, B12 and iron levels? So, um, and I do supplement all three. And, um, you know, the protein question, it is like the classic plant-based protein question. Um, I already had an understanding of what, how much protein I was getting to mm-hmm. sustain, you know, very, very you know, two, three hours of training a day most days. And so going into pregnancy, I kind of knew what my baseline was and that it was actually well above and beyond what they recommend for 
a pregnant human, let alone a pregnant plant-based athlete. Um, so yeah, I felt really confident. And to add to it, the fact that it was a type one pregnancy and you want to keep your blood sugar within non-diabetic ranges, mm -hmm. I wasn't going to upset the apple cart too much. It was mm -hmm. like, if I know if I can eat this, this, and that, and this is what works pre and before, before and after training and different parts of my day, you know, the nuances that we just dis discussed as, a, as someone living with type one, I was just going to keep rocking with that. And it worked mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. for me. Good. All right. So plant-based smoothie in the morning. Oh, plant-based smoothie in the morning. And then I'll do my first training session. So usually in the morning, I have a lifting session, um, barbell work, everything from- Just at home. I'll go to a private training facility oh, okay. to do that. And then um, three or four days a week, I'll do a run. So in 45 minutes to an hour of running. <clears throat> and then I'll normally teach- Mid morning to um, afternoon, a Peloton. So I'll teach a handful of classes four days a week. And, and do you bank those in a row or how does that work? Usually. So um, a few days a week, I teach live classes where it'll be like a 30 minute and a 20 minute or a 45. You know, usually it's an under an hour of content live. Mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes I'm teaching up to two hours of content banked. So it might be like a bunch of. Might be, might be as many as five classes, but like about two hours of content total. Yeah. 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 So, and then, and then then it's meetings. It's either yeah. meetings with my agent, with Drew on some of the projects that, you know, that we're working on. Um, afternoons are usually like meetings or any kind of written or like mind solitary, like computer work that I have to do. Um, and, and do you have an assistant? Like I how do you, you do? Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would not function without my assistant, Corinne, <laughs> for sure. And then early to bed. Early to bed. Yeah. Then it's like make dinner, wrap up the day, hop on. After we put Athena to bed, it's usually back on the computer for a little bit for like more emails and stuff. And then I go to bed pretty early. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. by, by eight, nine o'clock, it's a wrap. Yeah. Um, that's pretty manageable. Yes, it really is. I've created a life that... Um, aligns with how I want to present in the world. And I'm grateful as hell that I get to honestly see my daughter as much as I, as I do. Like I remember my mom, who's a, a, a practicing physician still. So there were some days she would leave at seven in the morning and get back at seven at night. And at least now, even though, you know, I'm busy and my daughter is with our nanny who we love and I'm very grateful for, I can dip in and out and at least see her for 15, 20 minutes throughout the day um, and still feel like I'm honoring, yeah. you know, my work life and being productive. And how does it work with social media? I mean, you have almost like a million people that are following you on Instagram. Do you feel pressure to be posting and sharing insights or how, how do you kind of, you know, calibrate how you interact with that to maintain some level of privacy and, and groundedness? Because that's a lot of people, right? I suspect there's some probably, you probably feel some pressure to be servicing that. Yeah. I mean, it, the storytelling around that is very organic. So, you know, we kind of have, I've developed a social media strategy and I kind of know what's going to live in different verticals of that. So like, there's like the Peloton stuff, there's motivation, there's the mom stuff, you know? Um, and then there's stuff like this week where I'm just posting organically, you know, when I, when I feel like it. Um, it's, I, I had to decide a long time ago to take the pressure off of that, mm -hmm. you know? So it's- You don't have like rules like every no. day I do this. Absolutely or every, not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely not. No. That's the only way that I can stay sane with the whole thing. Like my rule is like, I only post when I feel like it. Mm -hmm. And I just don't, if I don't feel like it, like you just can't be held hostage by it. Like it's just not healthy. I agree. Do you have notifications on your phone from all no, these things? No, no, yeah, no, 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 me neither. I don't have any notifications for anything. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then like in the household though, like one of my kids is texting me and I don't get, you know, it's like, if I'm not checking my phone, they're like, yeah, I texted you. And I was like, sorry. You well, know, this, like, per, this perception that of immediacy of in response um, to anything. I mean, I remember, you know, I, when you practice law, people probably still sent written letters. Yeah, of right? course. <laughs> You know? So there was like a, at least which a, was an art form, exactly. especially like the demand letter. Like, how snarky can I be in this letter? You know, you <laughs> pour over it for hours. Um, yeah, I mean, and I, I'm prey to just like anybody else. You know, the 
the distractions and the this um this perception that that time is that we that we need to be as immediate with our response as it was in the sender's perception and, and i just don't I, I really try to release myself from those expectations yeah yeah that's healthy and go to coachella without exactly your baby, you know? <laughs> um what else do i want to talk to you about i mean i think uh it's really cool what you've built and what you stand for and what you've done and to like own your strength, I think is really um, not just powerful, but like infectious. And I think part of your appeal, if I had to guess, is that everyone wants to feel a little bit more empowered. Like they see you talking about crowns and like owning your space and all of that. And I think to some degree, we all self-flagellate and we all have insecurities and to see you like, as, a, as this ballast going, no, do this instead. Like, I need a little bit more of that in my life. Like, I want that. Like, so for people that are, are feeling that urge or that pull or that yearning for a little bit more self-efficacy and, and agency in their life, like maybe it would be helpful to just kind of share spontaneously a little bit of that w- wisdom. Sure. I mean, I, I do think a lot of your listeners have some type of movement practice. I think that has movement has changed my life. I, I didn't know. I wasn't an athlete as a kid. I was completely terrified of gym class. I told myself I was like, you know, I used to get ma- made fun of for the way I ran when I was, you know, in recess or whatever. Mm. So I told myself the story at a really young age that I was the straight A student arts and crafts kid. And that was all I, that's who I was. And, um, I am introverted by nature. So those, you know, being good at school and doing arts and crafts really suited my nature. And movement has unlocked a wellspring of confidence. And I do believe that confidence is a side effect of hustle. I think that you have to really drill down on what form of hustle feels rewarding and is getting you closer to the finish line of your own definition. Mm -hmm. And um, a regular movement practice is crucial no matter what that looks like. Um, For me, another tool in the toolkit is storytelling. Like I think when we have a, when we're brave enough to tell our stories, um, it, it frees up um, like the, it frees up our ability to imagine our, the answers to those questions, right? It's like, what is my why? What decision would I make if I were twice as confident? You know, the, those existential who am I moments? Um, why not me? You know, those things are always kind of percolating in my head, but it's really crucial to me that folks give, some, give themselves permission to win where sometimes success feels as uncomfortable as the work that it took to get there. And um, I want folks to give themselves permission to like step into the light. Like Mm -hmm. I want to see, stand closer to the folks who illuminate you Mm -hmm. and um, even pay attention to who and what that is. Like who, most people would have to think long and hard of about the experiences that even bring them the most joy or the people that they're with when they experience joy or what joy even feels like recently. Um, we should be centering those conversations more. Yeah, I think that's powerful. That goes to the that second tier that we were talking about, the who am I thing. And I think it is true that most people are are so sufficiently disconnected that they aren't aware of what brings them joy or what is driving their decisions or you know, the activities that would gird their life with more purpose and fulfillment and meaning and the like. And I think a process of starting to better understand yourself and what makes you tick is yes, in the journaling, but also, as you mentioned, um, having the courage to share your story. We all have our, we all have a story, right? And that courage is born out of a choice to be vulnerable. Like the vulnerability is strength Mm -hmm. because it takes bravery and courage to share something and allow yourself to be vulnerable and judged for that. But my experience and the experience 
of many others that I've borne witness to and yourself as well, is that when you can summon that and, and engage with that, like grapple with that, there is a level of self-efficacy and self-esteem that derives from that, that allows you to be more self-integrated and self-actualized to stand in that power, to adorn that crown yeah. and like claim your truth and your path. Well, speaking your story, speaking your truth is gonna magnetize your people. Like I, I think about, that's what I've done. You know, of course it's on a, a very public platform, be it social media or Peloton, but speaking my truth has magnetized people who mm-hmm. that truth resonates yeah, with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the lighthouse thing. That's the light. Yeah, exactly. It's the lighthouse thing. It's like, how are your people going to find you if you're confused, misaligned, and ob- obfuscating who you are? Um, and then, you know, part of the part of movement and our movement practices are an ability to like discover who that person even is. You know, something that I ask myself as a touch point pretty frequently are like, what are my recent moments of flow? Am I still finding moments of flow where I'm losing track of time? Not because I'm scrolling on social media, but because I'm so immersed with focus and alignment, feelings of alignment that and fulfillment. Am I still, am I centering those experiences throughout my workday? Mm. Um, and I definitely go through periods where that, 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 that isn't as much the case. Mm-hmm. And it then takes it's more like, discipline what, to do that now so than much. it ever has before. But I would say most people don't ask themselves that question of when, when am, I, am, am I experiencing moments of flow? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's so easy and reflexive to just grab the phone. My yeah. eldest, uh, my eldest stepson Tyler just got the light phone, which is you know has nothing on it except oh, for like texting. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, in the first week, I read two books, you know, and he's like, I'm doing all these things that I'd never done before. And he has his other iPhone. He just has it in a drawer, you know, and checks it once in a while or whatever. But when he's out in the world, he's like, Yeah, I was standing in a line the other day, and there was nothing for me to do except be with myself, and it was like a revelation, you know. And, you know, I'm as guilty as anyone of that to exercise as a disciplined person. I find myself powerless at times to exercise the discipline required to carve out the quiet time to do the deep work, to accomplish the more important things. Just to even be bored. Mm -hmm. I actually, on that note, I made a rule this year um, to not grab my phone when when I'm in elevators. And even when I'm like just on the cusp of sending an email, when I get into the elevator to force myself to like, even just be aware and have a human interaction. Uh-huh. Um, but then you're like, it's creepy. No, I force myself like- <laughs> in that. I, and, and I am very <laughs> allergic to like, <sighs> I don't like small talk, mm. but I find that it's like, just let your mind, when's the last time that, you, that I let my mind wander? Yeah, I'm always just, gra- again, grabbing to my, grabbing yeah. my phone, refreshing the email, like checking Instagram. And the wandering mind is the bread and butter yeah. of any creative inspiration. Yeah. And if you deprive yourself of that, you're, you're, it's, it's a form of self-harm. Yeah. Well, that's where I, um, you know, j- journaling also helps because there are some days where I don't feel like I have anything to journal, mm-hmm. but I'll just set five minutes, a five minute timer on my phone and something always pours out. So what is the structure to the journaling? Is it like morning pages where it's just sort of a vomitous thing or do you approach it with a certain intention? Usually it's in the evening actually, before I go to bed. Um, I find that my mornings are a little bit, very, very, or a lot focused on Athena. Um, So it's evening focused. And sometimes it's, there's an emotionality to it where it's just like, I'm frustrated about this or that. And it's more of like a dear, dear diary moment. Um, but the days where I don't feel like I have anything to write, I will literally just set a timer and dream, you know, mm-hmm. whether it's like, what I'll ask myself questions like who, who is a dream partnership or like, what would success look like in Q1? You know, how are you defining that for yourself? So sometimes it's like business ideations and sometimes it's more personal. Um, and then it's that gratitude thing. I still, I ask myself that pretty frequently. Like, what do you have right now that you used to dream about or pray for? Mm-hmm. And um, I also find that with a gratitude practice, there's a recency that helps, you know, like saying like, three things that you're grateful for. Like, I'm always going to say Athena, Drew, my family, you know, and then that kind of takes away from the special feeling. But being feeling. very specific and Spe- temporal. 
Yeah. yeah, temporal. Like it'll be like in the last 12 hours, what's something that you're grateful for that occurred or, you know, that you witnessed in those last, in that, in, in that recent time period. And mm-hmm. that helps too. Mm. And what goes into the morning smoothie? Oh gosh. My husband is actually the smoothie king. Um, so I use AG1. And he's jacked. <laughs> he is jacked. Is he plant-based too? Plant-based. Yeah, he's completely he's, ripped. He's a... He's a strong individual. He's a very strong young man. <laughs> um, so yeah, we use AG1, plant protein. We mix up what kind of protein we use all the time. Um, magnesium, vitamin D, um, greens, like spinach, kale, whatever we have in the fridge. Yeah, there's like 17 ingredients. Right. <laughs> and how has your marriage evolved from being, you know, just the two of you to being three? Like what are the things that you've learned about being in partnership? And also now like this web three thing, like you're kind of, yeah. Commingled a little bit professionally in a way that you weren't pre- previously. Like what are the challenges that you faced and what are some of the lessons that you learned about um, what's required to stay together? It wasn't until we had Athena that I understood, you know, that it was like, I have my life, Drew has his life. And then our marriage is like another life that we both pour into. Whereas it all felt very like, yeah, okay, yeah, that's my husband. Of course, I love mm-hmm. him. Like we do our thing. Now it's, the date nights and making sure that we have time for each other, um, which all just, it was like every, all, all the time was time with each other before Athena. And now, you know, as life busies, it's, that has now risen to the top of the list of making mm-hmm. sure that I'm prioritizing yeah. my time with him. And we've done a great job. You know, travel and adventure is part of who is in the DNA of our relationship. We, um, actually got engaged 72 hours after meeting each other and then got married at Burning Man three months later. I knew knew that. So we, you know, we believe we're like multiple lifetimes Uh in and we have a very cosmic connection. Marriage, like a, but then you got married, you got married in Saloom, right? Yeah. So we had a Burning Man ceremony three months after meeting each other. And then Uh we had, you know, a public ceremony in Saloom a few years later. Um, But, making sure that we're planning trips, whether it's this, you know, we're going to a friend's wedding in Ireland. We're going back to Burning Man. We, and of course we have trips planned with Athena as well. Um, and we're, we're making sure that we're adventuring as a family, but also as a couple and individually. We've, we've both with each taken trips alone since having Athena. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, we're kind of trying to find the right balance, um, intentional balance and alignment with our values of, you know, individual time and then as a family and then as a couple. Anything unforeseen or a challenge that you didn't expect? Um, we communicate, like, I'm very clear with, you know, what I need, whether, I, I think that- That's important. I think that helps a lot, right? It, it, he, I don't expect him to be a right. mind reader and likewise. Because yeah. uh, uh, for a lot of, partnerships, it's sort of like you have to do a little bit of mind reading or anticipation. And the more clear that you can be, I think everybody benefits from that. Um, Even if it's an uncomfortable truth. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty (laughs) clear. I mean, I I remember, you know, Drew was really, it was incredibly, um, an incredible partner, you know, when Athena was first home. I mean, he's an incredible partner always, but especially as as it involved caring for a small human, our new roommate. And I would, you know, wake up at two in the morning or however many times at night to feed. And we set up like a breastfeeding station with like snacks and whatever. And one time he ate the almond butter sandwich that I had waiting for, that he had prepared, but he ate like half of it. And Uh it's like a very clear boundary. Like you cannot eat my snacks Uh (laughs) when I'm breastfeeding at two in the morning. So little things like that are actually big things. It's like he's, we're setting each, trying to set each other up for success. So Mm. no, no no one person needs to feel like a mind reader. Yeah. Well, the complexity uh, of the child really um, ups the exigency of that communication and the planning and all of that, because it's so easy to default to a routine. And before you know it, you're leading separate lives and you haven't really talked. Like yeah. I see it all the time. And it really requires a level of like conscious awareness to say, hey, oh, we need to like stop. We need, here's, we got to like get in sync here because yeah. otherwise we're like, you know, extrapolate that little tiny diversion and suddenly we're, you know, in very different places and not too long. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to be aware of the marriage as an organism as well as, you know, Drew as a, Mm -hmm. you know, sentient being and myself, right? So it's, 
it's actually three entities or humans kind of that we're curating and we're nurturing, mm -hmm. not just, and I mean three as in the marriage and then the two of us individually. And then of course our family is an organism, but that's, that's the more obvious one. Yeah. I like the idea of the separate trips thing. I mean, that's something that Julie and I have done as well. It's sort of like, you're your own human. I don't need you to complete me. We're awesome together, but you, I don't want to stand in the way of you having the experiences in your life that you want to have. Like you have yes. to have that green light for that type of thing. And obviously it has to work within the construct of the family, but um, I found that to be, you know, going both ways in our, in our marriage to be really beneficial. Yeah. And then, you know, you have interesting things to talk about. Like I want him to feel fulfilled and, and it's an opportunity to miss each other. I think mm -hmm. that that's a very good thing. Yeah. Is New York still your boyfriend? New York, New York is still my boyfriend. Are you cheating on your husband no. with New York? <laughs> well, thankfully, <laughs> Drew also is, you know, in love with New York. So uh -huh. I would say New York is probably just an element of our marriage right. at this point. It's but, a um, yeah. yeah, exactly. That's yeah, the other we, piece we love that New York. has to get attended to and, you know, the other individual in the relationship, right? Yeah, yeah. No, New York is home base for sure. We bought a home in New York. Um, you know, we're going to be applying to schools in New York for Athena, whatever that anywhere. looks like. That's a whole... Yeah, is thing. New York coming back? Like New York's, New York's had, back. had a roller coaster ride, but I was back there be last spring and I was like, this is off the hook. Like, I don't know what everyone's talking it's about. buzzing. I mean, Midtown, maybe not so much, but- Yeah, there's you know, some, I mean, there are definitely shuttered businesses whatever, and stuff, but, but- When the weather got nice, like everyone was out and it seemed like there was a lot of energy. People are out and about. Mm -hmm. People are craving interactions and- you know, I don't, I don't go out like to nightclubs or anything really anymore, but that like my friends who do are like, it is back in a way that mm. unprecedented Of course numbers. it is because yeah. New York city is undefeated. Yeah. Right. And resilient as hell. Like we're always gonna find a way, mm -hmm. find a way to maintain um, the swagger. Yeah. I miss it. You're playing right away. I know. I got to come back this spring at some point. Um, well, let's round this out with maybe a final few thoughts for the person who is struggling to get off the couch, who's contemplating that movement practice, who's looking for a little bit uh, of direction and and maybe purpose in their life. Like, get them off the couch. Oh my Robin, God. Come on. Um, this is what you do. Listen, you got to start with one. If you don't like something, change it. I think that excuses are lies that we tell ourselves convincingly. And how many, how many episodes of the RRP are you going to listen to before you get off I your mean, butt? I mean, come on, <laughs> right? Um, but it really starts with one. It can be really intimidating to look at the social media feed and think that everybody ran a marathon before 6 a.m. and they all are a five-minute mile. You know what I mean? Like there, there is, there's an, there's a, the other side to that aspirational, you know, the inspiration business is, is, is feeling like, oh, mm that just made me feel paralyzed with what I'm capable of. Yeah. So start with one, literally start with one, like lace up, do one block, do one Peloton workout, like do one. And then that's what, that's why I say that confidence is a side effect of hustle. Because when you take those little nibbles of hustle, you discover that you really have the power all along. And, and then that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And when you realize that you are a self-generated factory of power, uh, yeah, your life changes. You're, when you develop an appetite for your own power, mediocrity doesn't taste so good anymore. Polish your crown. <laughs> That's right. Always a pleasure, Robin. Thank you so much. You, okay. are, uh, you are an inspiration. I love you dearly. Um, I think it's so cool what you're doing in the world. I love and, you too. Uh, Thanks for having yeah, me. This is so course. nice to see you, friend. Yeah, I know. We did it in we LA. We did it. We did it. We'll do it again in New York at some point. I'm sure yeah. you're always welcome here. It's been too long. So thank you for sharing your wisdom. Everybody should check out Robin's Masterclass. Where's, yeah. Where did they find that? Is it Masterclass.com? Uh, masterclass. Yeah, masterclass, masterclass app. Com. Mm -hmm. um, the app, right, of course. And uh, Strong Mama, the strong, new book. Strong Mama is my yeah. children's book. And of course, you can find me at Peloton. Um, and Robin Ar RobinArdison.com. There you go. All the stuff. Yeah. All right. All right. Love you, Robin. Thank you. Love you too. Thanks Peace. for having me. Plants. Yeah.